And, and I wanted to uh, introduce, so uh, in, in keeping up with our new structure of doing, you know, the every other meeting and having guest speakers and just open topics, um, it was just fitting that uh, right when we started to make that decision, uh, James Heimbuck reached out and said he had some, um, uh, wanted to get some word out to the essays about how to uh, replace Sonar Cube uh, with, um, uh, with GitLab and, uh, talk to, to, and wanted to talk to some essays about it. So I recommended coming to this meeting to do just that. So I'd very much like to welcome, uh, uh, very happy to have James Heimbuck, uh, Senior Product Manager for the Verified Testing part of the application here on with us today. Uh, James, I'm going to pass it over to you so you can just um, dazzle us with what you got. I think you're overselling it a bit so far, David, but I will try. I will try. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. This one that he didn't buy from us, correct? This one he bought from a different Sorry, the co-working space is a little loud today at home. Um, so this is a pitch deck that I put together. A lot of the product managers are going through this. I'm gonna blaze through the first couple of slides and get to the roadmap, the important part. Um, like David said, uh, I've heard from a bunch of you folks. Uh, we've been on calls together. We've had chats in Slack about how can we uh, better sell code quality and as a replacement specifically for SonarCube because we find that so many of our customers are trying to replace that tool with a couple of features or a couple of categories even within GitLab. And honestly, on the code quality side, we've been behind. And so I wanted to preview the roadmap, talk about work that we've done so far and who it appeals to those personas and where it sits in the tiers uh, so that we can help with that um, story around selling ultimate, really selling a, uh, a secure app or a security play uh, and getting customers onboarded to that in GitLab. So going through the deck here real quick um, and I'll record a walkthrough of this as well at some point that you feel free to use. Uh, it'll be posted on and filtered. Uh, just a quick, the mission for verified testing, really we want teams to be confident in the code that they're deploying. Uh, quick overview of our vision. Uh, and this all comes from some of the handbook pages that the teams put together. Uh, some information about the jobs to be done and the personas that we're uh, trying to sell into. And the current capabilities, and I'll be keeping this up to date, but this really is kind of just bullet points around within the testing categories. Where do we have current capabilities for those personas? What can they do today? Customer success stories, which would love to hear from you, customers who are using some of those capabilities, success that they've had to date, um, so that we can fill this slide in a bit. And then this is where I wanted to really dig in. Uh, this near-term roadmap is really focused in on code quality. So I've broken this down into what we're working on now, which is really improving the code quality and the review experience. We're gonna start decorating those merge request diffs uh, with code quality violations. So if you have introduced a new code quality violation as part of your change, you're gonna see that as part of the code review in addition to the test coverage visualization that's already there. So a reviewer can see really easily, hey, this is not covered by a test and we've introduced something that one of the linters that the code quality pieces has found. Uh, in talking to Taylor, we understand that the SAS group is following on and they're gonna be introducing this as well. And this will exist in the ultimate tier uh, so that we can really help tell that story, like I said, about um, being a, a premier AST uh, provider. The next thing the team is gonna be working on to improve our code quality experience is really letting teams customize which violations they see, starting with uh, saying, I don't wanna see these minimal violations at all. So only show me things that are critical and major. I don't wanna be bothered with the rest. And then blocking a merge if there is a degradation. We understand that code quality gates is one of the real blockers or one of the key features from Sonar Cube that customers are missing and what's preventing them from getting that out of their tool chain and really utilizing code quality. And if not gonna replace Sonar Cube for code quality, why bother replacing it for SAS as well? Uh, beyond that, we'll be able to Uh, we'll be able to block on a test coverage degradation as well. Uh, blocking on the code quality will exist at the ultimate tier. Test coverage violation will be down in the core. And then later down the line, what we're looking at is helping teams identify flaky tests with a project history report, 
just release an MVC there so that you can see if the test has failed repeatedly in your default branch. And then the overall view of the project quality. And all of these, I'll share the deck with uh, David and he can distribute it. Um, but all of these link into issues and most of these issues are scheduled. The overall project quality is gonna be a real MVC approach to it of combining a few different stats but it gives that director persona, the dashboard to say, hey, my code coverage is increasing. It's gotten better over the last 90 days. Hey, the number of tests that are passing, it's gotten better over the last 90 days. Hey, the number of quality violations that we've had, that's also gone up. We need to go and focus in there and then be able to drill down into the projects and see, hey, which project is that that's really causing this to be a problem? And then where these things sit and how we think about how they tier. Um, in the free tier, we want developers to see how accessibility, code quality, all of those things are changing within their merge request as compared to the target branch. And team leads can track that test coverage within a project. In the premium tier, developers can see how load performance and browser performance has changed, again, in their MR compared to the target branch, as well as start to track some custom metrics, uh, which is an area we think there's a lot of potential growth in, and we're going to be exploring in the second half of the year. And then directors can track that test coverage over all of the projects in their group over time. And then coming in ultimate, is the ability for developers to be able to review that code quality change as part of the MR diff and then block when the code quality degrades. And those app dev managers and directors be able to review that overall quality of the project, track those changes over time, those dashboards around how is quality trending. That's the other big piece that I continue to hear about uh, along with the quality gates that's blocking customers from really picking up GitLab as an all-in-one solution and getting Sonar Cube out of their tool chain. So that's where we're going with testing uh, over the coming months. Like I said, I'll share the deck with David and you can link into all the issues, follow our progress there. Uh, love to have comments on that and open it up to any questions if anybody has anything they wanna dig into right now. Um, you mentioned sorry. stuff coming in the near term. When, what release would that be? Or now? Near, yeah, um, coming in the near term or what we're working on now. Um, the code quality violations in the MR diff, the first version of that will be coming in 13.11. And right now we have an issue open to get design feedback on what will actually be painted on the lines. Uh, so we'd love to get feedback there. I can share that as well. Uh, if you wanna show it off to customers if they're interested in that kind of capability, we'd love to hear their input on the design um, just to make sure that we're actually solving for that problem. James, I want to make sure real quick. I'm sorry, Hugo. Um, I do have a Q and A um, uh, links in the in the doc for the for the meeting. Uh, I want to make sure we answer those. I know Pete's got one in there. So if you if you have a question, if you wouldn't mind just typing it in the doc real quick, and then we can just um, ask them in the order they're other type there. Thanks. Yeah, Pete, you got one. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, my question um, right now. I think code quality is the only template that's running with Docker. Needs Docker and Docker right now. We moved a lot of secure over. Had a lot of trouble with uh, a customer that's you know running local. Um, runners that are locked down pretty much. Are we going to get away from Docker and Docker? Yeah, right now we're focused in on the features that we've talked about, but we we realized that Docker and Docker is a blocker. Um, the underlying engine, the code climate engine requires it and requires mounting the Docker socket. So we're going to start looking into other tools that don't have that requirement, bring them in and we can replace the code climate piece because it is going to be just, it's such a blocker for us. Um, for customers who are locked down security wise, it's a blocker for folks who are air gapped and downloading that Docker image is just kind of the long pole in the tent when it comes to performance. Uh, we understand that sometimes that code quality scan is one of the longer ones uh, with not a lot of value added. So we want to solve for that problem and we think getting away from that is going to be a good way to do it. Great, thanks. Hey, James, Sharing, can you? I think you have the... Yeah, can you talk a little bit about quality dashboard and the plan for that? Yeah, um, initially our plan is to really just count how many violations there were. This hasn't gone through solution validation yet. That's gonna be one of my next steps. Uh, but we think that that's a good start to say, hey, you had this many high and critical violations. You have this many right now in your project and you had this many 30 days ago. So this is the way that it's trending. Um, you can see some of the future vision on the code quality direction page. Uh, Juan, um, our former designer, when he was here, went through, we did um, some really visionary design about what that could look like. And so it's included there. 
Uh, next is mine. Uh, just wondering if uh, OpenShift support is on the horizon at all, or is that something that you're not looking at all? I have not looked at it specifically, but I understand that our Docker and Docker problem is also a blocker for OpenShift support. That's another thing that uh, for me helps prioritize how do we get away from this um, so that we can open up to those OpenShift folks. I think uh, Ugo is next. Yes. So when I looked at this, this slide where you mentioned the roadmap and the cheers, it seems backwards to me. It seems like premium was director level functionality and then ultimate app dev management in a project level. Whereas where everything else in GitLab is the opposite. Whatever's project is premium, whatever comes to the group level is more ultimate. Uh, do you mind elaborate on that, on the why behind it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of the features that we're building for code quality because of the overlap with SAST and the potential for being able to import results from the open source SAST scanners into it, we're tiering an ultimate kind of regardless of the user persona uh, that gets value out of it. In addition to then our buyer-based persona uh, tiering, who, who really is going to buy for this? And code quality goes along with that secure story of it's the director level who it cares about that, wants to buy it, wants to ensure that their projects have it. Okay. Does that make sense or do you want, you want to dig in a little bit more? No, no, don't need, but thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I, I was talking to one partner who does uh, AI for both volumes and code quality who wants to integrate and I had to explain, you know, code quality is behind um, and uh, the formats are very different, but it also made me wonder, I didn't talk to them about this, if we're going to try to make it the experience as similar as possible and if it's, if there's any possibility of reusing code to get there quicker. Yeah, absolutely. When it comes to the dashboards, we went to <laughs> steal liberally, uh, I'll say, um, or basically reuse what the SaaS team has put together for the vulnerability dashboard um, because we want it to be the same experience as much as possible. Uh, Taylor and I are even starting talking about, should we put both of these into the same place? We don't want customers to have to bounce back and forth between dashboards and potentially even see things that are found on both. That's just a really poor user experience that we don't want anyone to have to go through. Um, we don't want to go through that learning pain either. So anything that we can combine or reuse and possibly even combine is what we're going to explore as we get closer to that. The, the other question, I guess, or follow-up I have is, um, I also had another uh, partner who does infrastructure as code SaaS, and I had to guide them to do JUnit output for non-premium customers or non-ultimate customers and our JSON output for ultimate customers. And I guess I just wanted to raise awareness that for our partners, they're not gonna wanna limit their integration with us to ultimate, though I know in our tooling, we might do that. We might say, you don't get any test visualization at all if you're not an ultimate. But for them, they're gonna want to still be able to have as much value as possible. And so JUnit is a reasonable alternative in those cases. So I guess it's more of a, I guess some input that um, this is one way that our partners who do security uh, plugins might view this very differently, differently than we do. Okay. I, on the code quality side, we're, we're not utilizing JUnit for any of the results. I think the fuzz testers or the fuzzing, when it was in its first stage, they were dumping some of those results into JUnit and since it changed their format. Um, yeah, so with this partner, they actually developed, they didn't even know about our JSON format. And so I made them aware and they had JUnit and I don't think they even knew that they could collect JUnit and have it visualized. So um, in walking through that process though, since they had both, I highlighted, well, hey, you know, for our non-ultimate customers, would you still like that visualization? And of course the answer is yeah, for sure. So we created some code that would automatically switch by detecting whether they have the security dashboard feature or not. So, but it, but it just made me aware that, wow, we might never ever care to, this would never hit our radar for internal stuff but for security partners, it would be pretty bad to them if there's no visualization below ultimate. So um, we, it can be handled if they'll build JUnit, but uh, maybe there's other ways to think about it too that I'm not thinking about. 
Uh, hey, this is Francis. Uh, this is really more feedback than a question, but I absolutely love the work that you guys are doing, the direction you're going in. I think it's tremendous. Um, just makes me really excited about selling GitLab in the future. So thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, Reb again, um, I was just noting, so we've got stuff on dashboards, just good feedback point. We talk to big customers all the time uh, and the big customers have like the executives who want to come in and say, what's my stuff doing? I presume these dashboards are going to roll up because not all of ours really do that at this point, but that's super important. So they can look at, for example, code quality. Hey, I've got, you know, in this whole tier, tree of stuff, you know, I've got, you know, these, this number of code quality issues that they can then drill down. I presume that's they were coming. Yeah, absolutely. That's um, that code quality kind of a dashboard. Our vision is that we roll it out at the project level first, then roll it out at the group level where it can be a roll up for them. Similar to what we've done with test coverage, where you have test coverage for a project is available in core, test coverage for the group, all of the projects for the group uh, is available at premium, similar thing. Thanks. Yeah, so my money, mine, mine is really related to what Darwin was talking about a minute ago. And I mean, honestly, I mean, James, you and I met a while back and um, my uh, hope for our test metrics and test reporting like skyrocketed after you and I talked. Um, it, you know, it's uh, there. There's a lot of features that people want and, you know, we don't have them right now, but we're working there. Um, you know, so my question really, you know, there was the Docker and Docker discussion earlier. And then, you know, like Darwin was just talking about having to do custom metrics. So, I mean, I've had to do that before with uh, some of the li some of the libraries that I use or some of the languages that I use that are automagical pop, you know, parsers don't take the output the right way. Right. Yep. Um, so with my primary thing is like with these new items such as coverage or such as uh, coverage change in this merge request. Will this be only related to, I, I guess I'm trying to make sure that we're gonna continue being able to do like Darwin was just talking about. So in other words, I have my Ansible over here and Ansible has its own code coverage solution or its own lint solution or whatever it may be, right? And now I have custom stuff that translates it to the format that you need so that you show it on my merge request. Um, well, when these new things such as your merge request increases coverage by this amount, um, I'm assuming this is still gonna be like some way text defined or something like that. So that with those of us who do use some funky scanner can actually write our output and it'll go into the UI. I mean, does that kind of make sense where I'm coming from? Yep. yep. We okay. want to ensure backwards compatibility. Um, we also think that if we get away from code climate specific to um, the code quality and get to a different type of scanner or a different collection of scanners, much like SAS has done, we can either take the existing code climate JSON or implement a new version, continue yep. to support code climate for as long as we need to, but have both of those map into a new this is what it looks like uh, for code quality results in GitLab. Um, that would open us up to community contribution where somebody has a new scanner, they wanna support the output, great, here's how you can parse it into our version so you can build for it and we can import your scanner. That's the hope, <laughs> but we definitely, we wanna maintain that backwards compatibility. So if you're, get, if you're you know, munching something into the format that works today, we wanna to continue to use it. And then all of these future features are built on top of that data. You're not going to need to give us new data to utilize them. Cool. Yeah. I mean, because like you mentioned, you know, mentioned the code, like the Docker. I mean, that Docker and Docker, right? If it, it's really not GitLab. It's it's code climate. And yep. if I have my own test automation, I mean, if Docker and Docker is a blocker for me, then okay, fine. I can go set up a build node over here that has all of the requirements to run testing, and I can run my testing on that thing not using Docker. And then I can populate your test results. Um, so, okay, cool. That's that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, there. That's I'm trying to remember now if I actually wrote that issue or not. I, I believe I've written an issue. <laughs> I'll have to double check um, for to create an API just to allow the reports to upload. Because really, running like you said, running the code climate Docker image or running that scan isn't a requirement for us to show any of this data. We just need the report because that's really where our functionality starts. Is 
parsing through that and populating it. Absolutely. So we were able to open that up to other types of scanners where somebody could drop that into their pipeline and we'll just consume that data. Great. Like that yeah, we're, we're happy with freaking that too. Awesome. Because <laughs> then it's like, okay, fine. You use, you keep using your third party tool to do whatever it is you're using already. Just make it send the data back over to us and hey, look at this beautiful merge request you've got with your data right there. Yep. And James also, it helps if we, um, use uh, de facto standards or support them. So I know that our, our vulnerability standard was based on a, a subset, I think, of an actual standard. And um, if we get too far away from that, we I guess what I'm trying to say is we sometimes inherit automatic compatibility with hundreds of existing tools because they comply with one of those de facto formats. Mm -hmm. So if we always support those out of the box, plus any enhanced ones we have, whether the parser is automatically detecting that or whatever, that that's super awesome because then this this vendor I had to ask them to write to our format, but um, if they don't have to, then all of a sudden we get a whole bunch of stuff that just works. Cool. And that that was like with CodeCub, they have a a shell script that you execute, and it can parse. What I mean, it's a it should have never been done in shell, but whatever. Um, it it parses whatever kind of output you got, you know, and it converts it to the CodeCub format. Then it pushes it to CodeCub, and so like you're saying, Darwin, in the sense of it, you know it. You don't have to build. You don't have to change all these other things. Yeah, and it seems like we should be writing an XSLT um, whenever we do have to transform it, so that we can reuse those recipes rather than write code in a whole bunch of different languages. Absolutely. Okay, time for about two more questions. Then we're going to move on to the uh, the next part of the stuff. So uh, I think Lori, you've got one here. I got the next one. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm running into some prospects where. They're on the IBM mainframe, the old mainframes, the AS400, the i-series, and they're running some legacy code. They want to be able to leverage DevOps and, and, and the languages that they're using within the DevOps platform. Um, have we considered any sort of the legacy code for code quality and procedure level analytics, perhaps? You know, languages like RPG, COBOL, Fortran, I know we should be, you know, persuading them to move and, and um, uh, modernize, but I mean, that's not going to happen right away. So. I'm just curious, James, what uh, you all have thought. I don't think Code, code Climate supports those languages, but other scanners might, so. Yeah, uh, we haven't dug in there too much. We've really been focused on how do we take the data that we get out of it and provide features that provide value to the customers. Um, mm -hmm. With Code Climate, we're kind of locked into what their base scanners are and the plugins that are out there. And those are usually community contributions um, within their community. Uh, we could definitely you know, step back in and say, hey, where where can we have the biggest bang for a buck in things that we don't support today uh, as we look beyond what Code Climate provides? Okay, certainly, because IBM, I mean, they see a, a big opportunity here with working with these older mainframe customers to, to get them, to, to, to allow them to adopt DevOps practices around some of that older stuff and such. Um, or so, you, um, you could, through partnerships, encourage IBM to write that? Or I see here that Sonar Cube actually does RPG. Well, I, I was just I was just going to say that Darwin Sonar Cube does support RPG. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I mean, I, I know we were taught some of this was you know how can we get away without using Sonar Cube, but uh, okay. in these situations we 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 may have to. So, um, and, and this particular prospect they use that for the those those quality checks. So, I think that's going to be our approach. I was just curious if you're considering it elsewhere. I think our right. last question right. is from Edmund. Edmund, yeah, you got a last yeah, question. Yeah, so similar to uh, the new door metrics that we've released around uh, release frequency, those are accessible by APIs. I uh, wonder if we're going to look to do the same thing around code quality so that some customers want to roll up the reporting to other dashboards. Yep. Um, it's not on the roadmap today. We generally are feature first or within the GitLab UI first and then look at API and what the appetite for customers is there. Um, it's something that we definitely consider. There's other areas around test coverage that customers are asking for an API because they have existing uh, ways of visualizing that data that they want to get at. So it's something we can consider. But right now, it's not the, the first thing that we would build. Thank you, James. And thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate the feedback. Love the questions. Uh, I'll try to go through and uh, get my comments back into a few of these async, uh, as well as answer anything we didn't get to today. And always available. Love talk, love chatting with this group. Thanks so much. Thanks, you really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. All right. Thank you all. I'm going to stop the recording because I'm going to put that part out so the other groups can uh, um, can take advantage of that from Amia and whomever. Um, so let me just stop the recording.